不是生出年龄，我给出年万岁嘛。맞아요맞아요어또많은분들께서또관심을보이고계시고지금최근한국분들이되게이제애정을쏟는프로젝트인것같기도해요지금벌써지금라이브스트리밍에57명57명이들어온다는거는첫방송인데어첫방송인데 <웃음> 어지금65분들어셨어요나중에몇천명들어오면은어어그치되게궁금하네요그러게요아되게많이들어오셨어요안경누나너무예뻐요 <웃음> 감사합니다안경이예쁘네요이런다이런문제같이한국에서크립토에대한관심이거래량을보면알수있지만맞아요주식시장보다더엄청나죠이게마켓이더커진거를제가느낀게어원래정말관심없는제친구들그러니까남성친구들말고여성친구들중에특히뭐미국주식하거나국내주식하는친구들이아의미없다 <웃음> 저는어제사고싶은 ETF, 해외 ETF 에서뭐증권을까야하는데진짜아이런앱으로아쓸수없다어떻게그러니까막해외은행마리아는어떻게쓸지모르겠어요진짜아이정도면은진짜크립토이렉스가그동안그나마열배는낫다진짜맞아 Hi to Shar. Hi. So let's start today's AMA. Let's do it. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And、um, to start with,、uh, uh, I'm going to introduce myself in Korean because our audiences are Korean.、Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. 네어안녕하세요여러분저는어국내외유수이프로젝트의커뮤니티빌딩을돕는넌스클래식에서헤드오브마케팅을담당하고있는홍유미라고합니다반갑습니다어그러면저희가어 to short, could you briefly introduce yourself to the Korean community? Yep. I think before introducing myself, I've been to Nantes and lived at Nantes as well in the past. This was the economy 2019, I think, if I'm not wrong, when I lived in Nantes,、mm -hmm. um, which was a phenomenal experience. I think,、uh, yeah, just getting so many. Stakeholders in the industry to come live together,、um, and、uh, and also obviously meeting、uh, Shi Yun and Yang Hoon、uh, back then, and you know, kind of talking about their vision was、uh, super interesting. I always wanted to replicate that in in different parts of the world.、Uh, it's it's still my dream. Obviously, been super busy, but you know, I think uh, uh, maybe in the next two three years would definitely want to because. I think crypto is such an ecosystem play. It's so unique.、Um, it it doesn't work like that in,、uh, I guess, in any other industry as much as it does in crypto. But I think aside from that, you know, quick introduction about myself.、Uh, so prior to starting Persistence, I was the first employee at Lunex Ventures, which is the crypto arm of a traditional VC called Golden Gate,、uh, based in Singapore.、Um, mm -hmm. Golden Gate actually has. Uh, very strong Korean ties as well.、Uh, so they have Hanwha and Naver、um, as as you know big LPs into the fund.、Um, and so I've spent a lot of time with、uh, folks from Hanwha as well, more on the traditional startup side,、um, and then also some of their crypto、uh, stuff because we used to be based in the same office in Singapore、uh, because、uh, Golden Gate and Hanwha were doing a fund together.、Uh, Anyway, so I was at Lunex as the first employee of the crypto fund, helped to set up the fund from scratch, including you know working with different service providers, lawyers, you know tax advisors, auditors, fund administrators, cybersecurity consultants, monetary authority of Singapore as the local regulator, and helped to raise capital from a publicly listed company in Japan,、um, the VC arm of a sovereign wealth fund, multiple family offices in Southeast Asia. 
um, and then deployed it into seven equity deals um, within the blockchain crypto space, and then you know, you know multiple kind of token deals, both in the primary and secondary markets. But for me, I'd spent about 10 years in Singapore. I wanted to bet on the Indian crypto ecosystem growing. Um, and so in 2019, uh, after having spent almost nine and a half years in Singapore, um, kind of decided to move to India. I was kind of shuttling between India, Singapore, and SF. Uh, but then, of course, COVID happened. And then so for the past 13 months, I've been based here in India. And um, yeah, I mean, if you look at the traditional startup market, um, India has the third largest number of unicorns globally after the US and China. Um, but 80% of these unicorns were born after the year 2010, which is almost 10 to 15 years after startups of similar sizes came about in the US and China. So India is big, you know, there's a lot of talent, there's a lot of ambition and hunger, but it operates with a bit of a lag. Um, and so that was my bet and hence, you know, moved um, to India in 2019 and, um, you know, have been building persistence. So that's a quick introduction about myself and how, you know, persistence came into being. Mm -hmm. I think like, um, hopefully, I think persistence will become the next unicorn that started from India. I, I hope so as well. Although, you know, just to clarify, we're a Singapore, you know, incorporated and Singapore based mm -hmm. true, true. Uh, project, but um, yeah, the theme is entirely from India. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you for the introduction. And next, um, Takpin of DSRB, could you yeah. uh, briefly introduce yourself? Yes. Uh, hi, um, my name is Hyuk. I'm co-founder and CSO of DSRB which is a, a, it's a validator slash blockchain infrastructure provider. Um, we're mostly focusing on um, uh, blockchain. Uh, we're mostly focusing on staking, uh, governance. Also, uh, we built a lot of uh, browser extension wallets for uh, major projects like Celo or Mina Protocol uh, and a few others. And also, we uh, also built a suite of uh, data analytics, uh, such as ChaiScan for Terra, um, also um, uh, Luna Whale, Cello Whale, and uh, like that, uh, just to name a few. Um, and we're, we're really interested in building um, the ecosystem as partners for the blockchain network. And basically, we're running uh, these networks as node operators, as validators, helping people on board and connect. Um, the East and the West, because uh, as Tushar just mentioned, um, blockchain is not, it doesn't happen at a single place. Um, if, you, if you're holding persistence anywhere around the world, um, you're welcome as part of the community. So uh, I think that's uh, revolutionary. It's, a, it's kind of a new, um, it's a very new experience for uh, myself as well as a lot of other people in the crypto space. So yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I would say, yeah, I mean, just sorry to jump in, but I would say like validators, uh, we truly believe are like owners of the network as well, right? In in all senses, um, you have economic skin in the game, you have, you know, skin in the game in terms of governance. And then of course, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, creating tooling to ensure the success of the network. So, you know, fr from our perspective, you know, we have huge um, respect for what validators do and also truly understand what their role is in terms of creating creating that network. But sorry, I jumped in. No, I was I was actually just gonna ask you a question. Like, you know, like you know, DSRV is obviously one of the leading validators, you know, in, in this ecosystem. And I was wondering what kind of crit criteria persistence has in you know choosing validators. And I was gonna ask you that, but I think you just uh, gave me yeah. an answer. Yeah, I think, you know, beyond what I just mentioned, I think in terms of, you know, choosing validators, I think, you know, one one is your, you know, basic infrastructure, I suppose. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of validators, you know, running in the cloud, but, um, and, and again, you know, you can still run in the cloud, but, you know, have, you know, certain redundancies in place. Um, but what we've seen is, like, if you look at proof of work mining, um, it is, heavily geographically centralized, you know, in, in China or, you know, certain locations where you might have cheaper electricity. Um, with POS mining or you know, proof of stake validation, um, 
for the most part, geographical decentralization is not a problem because um, you have validators all around the world. You have good validators in North America. You have good validators in Europe. You have good validators in different parts of Asia. Um, but what becomes a problem is infrastructure centralization, where like AWS goes down and like 35% of the validators on a network are going down. Um, and so that becomes an issue. Like I think Solana faced this problem where I think like some 40% of their validators were like in one data center. Thanks. Right. And so, yeah. Yeah. So, sorry. Oh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, yeah. the, the, the data center was called Hetzner. So yeah. like, 40%, I remember that, so. Yeah, um, and so, you know, now that data center was undergoing maintenance and suddenly it's disrupting an entire network um, is, you know, you have 40% of nodes going down. So, so in that sense, I think, you know, we prefer, it's not a requirement, but we prefer folks running, you know, bare metal, uh, you know, servers, you know, having the relevant redundancies in place, idly using, you know, uh, HSMs for, you know, key management and, and having all the redundancies in place, but we understand that that can be economically quite intense. Um, and so, um, because we're taking a multi-chain approach, um, so com for Comdex, you know, for, which is one of our applications, the requirements are slightly higher because the validators are validating very high value transactions, um, but on like per persistence itself, um, and also Comdex, it's a more permissioned environment as well, just because of the nature of the application. Uh, whereas, you know, for persistence, it's sort of, you know, completely permissionless and things like that. And so we don't have very stringent requirements for validators. But yeah, we have, you know, four validators from Korea, um, you know, supporting us. Uh, so, you know, Stake.fish, the SRV, of course, and B Harvest and Cosmos Station. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a, probably the most amount of centralization is in Korea for us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and last but not least, um, we have a superstar in the Cosmos <laughs> ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And here we have Josh. And Josh, could you briefly introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, I can introduce myself. Uh, hello, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Josh Lee. I'm co-founder slash CEO of Chainapsis. And yeah, we're a company building basically the MetaMask for Cosmos. And uh, it's kind of a browser extension wallet, which the key is providing connectivity between users and blockchain applications. And uh, for us, I think the bigger context is in the context of blockchain uh, interoperability. So, so natively supporting multi-chain environments and um, also in the context of application specific uh, blockchains as well, where um, the bottleneck of blockchain developers reaching users and the user reaching blockchain application isn't the kind of user infrastructure that has to exist in between. So uh, yeah, focusing on uh, flexibility, modularity, uh, and application specific transactions for blockchains uh, built with the Cosmos SDK, which is uh, for example, persistence and uh, a quickly growing ecosystem of many more blockchains as well. Mm -hmm. So, you're, so like in terms of, um, I think the significance of IBC lies in that, like it, like not it's not only just scalability, but it's also like helps user onboarding faster. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, the state of blockchain kind of replicates the how how. The world like the internet came to be and, and i think you know early days uh, people were using mainframe giant mainframe computers splitting time between the uh, many users that were wanting to use it whereas i think eventually that kind of spread out into more application specific personal computers mobile phones etc uh, with all of them kind of being connected over uh, a very well uh, generalized protocol that can manage all that. And I think for, for the blockchain sets, I think we're starting to see a shift from kind of a very generalized one virtual machine for everything into a more application specific blockchain that is able to communicate with each other uh, to provide not only scalability, uh, but also economic sovereignty and uh, yeah, a sense of kind of its own community as well. Mm -hmm. 
can you also mention the label theory of wallet? Oh yeah, yeah. I guess I forgot to mention that. Uh, uh, by yeah. So the wallet that we're creating is called uh, Kepler Wallet. Uh, right now we have uh, ten networks uh, supported and many more kind of being able to add their networks into Kepler as well. And we're in the process of releasing a mobile wallet kind of under the same thesis of providing modular, uh, flexible uh, transaction access for uh, yeah, much of the blockchain uh, interchange. Mm -hmm. Well, Kepler is great. It looks great. It works great. And um, do you have any plans to support persistence XPRT soon? Yeah, so so that's another issue is, it, is that I think the ecosystem itself has grown exponentially in the past maybe three or four months or so, which is really great to see. And I mean, it's, it's amazing to see how like the explosion of the ecosystem itself. And right now, I think we're at the stage where we're kind of trying to catch up to all of, a lot of that. Uh, that being said, um, it's definitely uh, on our radar, uh, on our watch list. And if we do happen to do it, uh, it's, it's probably going to be very soon. It's, it's going to be sooner like, rather than later. Let's say that. Yeah. Mm. Actually, uh, you know, users can go to wallets.persistence.one. And if they want to import their wallet using Kepler, they can do it right now itself. Um, but yes, you know, I think the formal, it's, I think you call that a beta integration, right? If I'm not wrong, mm -hmm. um, but I guess the formal integration is going to happen. But if someone, you know, wants to import an existing wallet using Kepler, they, they can do it for persistence right now as well. Absolutely. And yeah, and, that, and that's another thing is like, we want to enable permissionless innovation where anyone can uh, use, ha have access to wallet infrastructure. That's always kind of beta our long-term like core thesis as well. Yeah. Okay, great. So, um, Tushar, you probably get this question a lot, but could you briefly introduce the, the suite of persistence products of our Korean sure. community members? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, essentially, um, and I always, you know, like I've been a very long-term supporter of Terra. Um, and uh, was you know one of the early investors through the fund I was working at as well um, in, into Terra. It was one of the only primary token investments, only ICOs that we had done from the fund. Um, and uh, and again, I think you know for and also Terra is an investor into persistence as well. Terra was the absolute second investor into persistence. Um, in in general, um, the the ecosystem kind of evolved over a period of time as we saw, um, as we experimented with what's happening in the industry and as we saw demand or huge market opportunity somewhere. Um, so the first use case that we kind of started with was more on the commodity trading and trade financing side. So it was more real world focused um, uh, use case where we were working, where we are working with a commodity trading organization in Singapore and multiple family offices in the commodity trading space that have a strong nexus in in Southeast Asia and South Asia um, within the commodity trading space. So um, essentially that was the first use case. Um, Comdex is focused towards non-crypto native users. So it's focused on institutional commodity traders who don't know how to manage private keys or you know, hold a wallet, manage a wallet, um, create a wallet. And so a lot of the, you know, um, a lot of the UI and functionalities that have been created on Comdex are a lot of the Web3 complexities have been abstracted away. Um, fundamentally, though, uh, Comdex is an NFT marketplace because we represent these are physical commodities that are being traded and which don't have standardized contracts. So wheat originating from Canada is different from wheat originating from Australia, um, you know, for example. So on the back end, it's like an, like an NFT marketplace, but Obviously, from a UI perspective, it looks like a trading platform. Um, so uh, that was the first uh, use case. Um, in terms of, you know, we you were talking about IBC, um, our team under controlled and permissioned environments demonstrate, and most people talk about transfer of tokens, um, interchain transfer tokens from a fungible token perspective. We had demonstrated an interchain transaction in the context of NFTs. Uh, so moving uh, NFTs from one chain to another, uh, which was the foundation for the in, um, the research work that we did um, for the inter NFT working group 
which was backed by the Interchain Foundation. So trying to create interoperable standards for NFTs, um, which the, that framework is called Asset Mantle. And so Comdex is, you know, one of the first implementations of that. And then, you know, we're trying to create other implementations um, as well with a couple of interesting people, including, um, you know, some of the more, obviously Comdex is a very non-traditional implementation of NFTs, but some of the more traditional implementations of NFTs, you know, um, you know uh, art marketplaces and things like that, where, you know, fingers crossed, we're on the verge of, you know, signing a big deal uh, with a large, you know, player in the art ecosystem. So that's our work on the NFT side in terms of Comdex and Asset Mantle, including the research work that we've done. Um, last year, we were, uh, you know, when COVID hit really bad, uh, we were struggling to raise capital. Uh, this is, you know, prior to sort of the DeFi summer. Um, and so we started running validator nodes ourselves um, in order to just like fund operations, um, which is the, you know, great thing about, um, I guess, decentralized networks as well. Like you just need to be creative in order to fund yourself and, and fund um, um, growth. Um, and so that's how Audit One was born, where we run validator nodes ourselves um, on multiple networks. Um, it, you know, so what what happened last year was, you know, after we completed the fundraise, we want to wanted to have very high quality distribution of the persistence token. Um, so we wanted to distribute it to folks who are already familiar with staking. So we ran a stake drop campaign, where stakers of Atom, Luna, uh, Kava. Uh, could receive a very targeted airdrop of the persistence token. Um, and as a, you know, so within three months, we saw more than $900 million worth of staked assets participate in the stake drop, which kind of showed to us that there was a huge demand for unlocking uh, liquidity or yields from staked assets. And so that's how PStake uh, came about as well, um, which is the next application that we're gonna launch. Uh, sometime in May. So we're just undergoing security audits um, uh, and, and things like that. But, you know, PStake is the first sort of crypto native user application that, that we're going to launch. Um, and so again, you know, if you again, draw parallels with Terra, Terra has a tenement based chain. They have Chai as a non-crypto user facing application. And then they have Anchor and Mirror and multiple crypto native, uh, you know, user facing applications. For us, it's very similar where we have this tenement based chain. We have Comdex as a non-crypto user-facing product and then a bunch of sort of crypto-native user-facing products. Mm. I see, I see. So, uh, well, this is a rather direct question. And let's say that I am an XPRT holder. And then, like, what kind of, like, benefits would I get, like, from holding XPRT? Like sure, yeah. Um, so one is, you know, of course, you know, there is you know, inflation built in um, into the uh, into the network uh, for network security um, and uh, to incentivize, um, you know, the, the uh, validators and delegators. Um, and, and so, you know, that is one, but outside of that, XPRT is what we call a work token, um, which is essentially you stake uh, this token in order to, um, get the rights to sort of perform work, which is, you know, secure the network. And as a byproduct of that, receive uh, cash flows from the various applications. Um, so if you see, you know, similar to when you stake Luna, you have your staking rewards coming in multiple currencies. So USD, MNT, KRT, um, which are the, you know, different stable coins in, in which um, your rewards are coming. And then of course, once you actually claim the rewards, they all get you know, swapped into Luna itself and you get your rewards in Luna. Um, in our case, uh, we have, you know, sort of revenue share or, uh, um, you know, uh, fees that is being paid from the Comdex application, from PStake application and multiple other applications flowing into what we call a fee pool. Um, so on the PStake application, for example, the fees is actually going to be in Atoms itself because we're launching the liquid staking platform with Atoms. And so the PStake platform is generating fees in Atoms to begin with. Um, and um, essentially once the fees accrues in multiple currencies in the fee pool, then obviously when you know, people do that claim of the rewards, it gets you know, swapped into uh, XPRT. Um, 
Yeah. So essentially, it is uh, you know like you mentioned, it's a work token. When if you stake your XPRT, you're essentially getting the upside from the different applications in the persistence ecosystem. Um, uh, can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. So you mentioned that commodities are represented as uh, NFTs. Um, yeah. I thought that was very interesting. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so, so does that mean that like, for example, like we shipped on a boat, um, are those represented as NFTs and traded or uh, is, it the, uh, is it the invoices that are traded as an NFT? Mm -hmm. uh, can you maybe uh, explain further on that? Yeah, so, um, um, so goods on a ship are represented by this document called bill of lading. Uh, and so whoever has possession of the bill of lading essentially owns that commodity on the ship. Once you load a good, um, good on, the, on the ship, the port authority issues that bill of lading, but that bill of lading gets traded several times while the goods are still on the ship. Um, and that's the high seas commodity trading that Comdex facilitates. Um, and, and so, when we talk about NFTs in the context of Comdex, there are two kinds of NFTs. One is to represent the bill of lading itself, which is being traded. Um, so you can you know, think of the bill of lading as just a piece of whatever art or something that is unique, that is just changing hands. Um, and then the resulting invoice. So you know, similar to how every like crypto kitty is unique, every bill of lading is unique because it represents a unique commodity, a unique amount, a unique, commodity itself, unique origination port, unique port of destination. And so the parameters are all unique. Um, and then the resulting invoice is a separate NFT. Um, yeah. Um, which the invoice itself, you know, you can trade accounts receivables, um, which is a fairly standard practice, you know, in the, in the banking world. Um, so that invoice can be traded multiple times as well. And there's this you know, concept of invoice discounting. Um, uh, so you, you're trading the commodities themselves, but usually the buyers and the sellers, they all do the commodity trading on leverage. So it's all trade, all, all done trade financing. Oh. Um, and, uh, and so that's where the financiers step in and, you know, um, do invoice financing, invoice discounting, and, and that gets traded as well. So there are two, so two NFTs that are being uh, represented. Um, it, is, it is a little bit complex, um, but again, you know, as we kind of move from this quote unquote speculative phase into a value creation phase in the industry, we'll see more and more projects, you know, um, trying to solve these, what we call the, you know, the real world problems. And, you know, it's, it's um, uh, I think a lot of the, you know, tooling and the foundations are being laid down to, to actually create, you know, such use cases. And the best thing is when you're using the complex application, it doesn't, you don't know that, you know, there are NFTs or stable coins or those kinds of things in the background. Um, your login, your, you know, use, you log in using a username password. Um, which is linked to your public private key pair. Um, um, and, you know, very similar to NBA Top Shots, right? Where like, if you, you know, go to NBA Top Shot, you don't know that you're using a Web3 application, um, which is a bit of a, you know, a question mark as well um, for some of the purists. But of course, you know, it drives adoption and, you know, it's geared towards what's best for the end user. Yeah, uh, it's it's really inspiring to see um, these uh, blockchain projects coming to the real world, and especially in areas like uh, commodities tradings, because it's been around for uh, hundreds, hundreds of years. A um, uh, question I have is, um, so um, ha like having having a decentralized commodities trading platform, like how would that uh, benefit? Uh, the, the the traditional or the current commodities trading uh, space? Again, you know, uh, commodity trading and trade financing is a use case that, you know, people have tried, been trying to do since 2015. Um, 
using uh, using blockchain. But I think there are a few things that kind of really helps, um, you know, a few problems that are uh, being addressed. Um, and some are addressed fully, some are not, you know, some are, you know, just a little bit better than what the current mechanism is or what the current processes are. So one is just the, you know, uh, the document provenance. Um, which is, you know, you have multiple stakeholders involved in commodity trading. So you have the traders, the trade financiers, the insurance companies, the bankers, um, the lawyers, regulators, um, as the different stakeholders that need to have access to the same information. Um, so in that context, you can even think of um, it as like a SaaS application with multiple users having access, different access rights and access to, you know, certain information that they need um, uh, you know, access to with, you know, while ensuring that, you know, the um, the data itself has not been, um, you know, tinkered with. Obviously, that problem is not 100% solved because there is, you know, some element of, th there is human involvement. And so, you know, there can still be certain problems with that. Um, the second problem is more, uh, second thing is more in terms of um, the speed of, uh, cross-border settlements of the trades. Um, so using SWIFT, you settle on a T plus two, T plus three uh, basis. Um, and so if you do a transaction on Friday, it'll probably go through by Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, and in commodity trading, because the, uh, the notional size of the trades are large, um, every additional day that it takes to settle a transaction is opportunity cost in terms of, you know, um, the traders doing another trade or, you know, you earning interest on, on that capital. Um, and so, you know, using stable coins in the back, um, you know, we facilitate instant settlement, uh, at least in the major commodity trading hubs, which is Singapore, Hong Kong, um, uh, Kuala Lumpur and Dubai in Asia, um, which is where all of the clients of Comdex are based out of. Um, and uh, the third problem is just in terms of trade financing, which is building a credit history. So Comdex is focused more on the small to medium sized commodity traders and not the large commodity trading organizations. So, uh, and the small to medium sized commodity traders are the ones that have the biggest need for access to financing and have the most amount of trouble getting access to financing. So essentially building a credit history for them on the platform to create credit worthiness for them to get access to financing um, in a much easier way. Uh, so it's a combination of, you know, having, you know, you know, adequate documentation and document provenance in place, instant settlements, and then getting access to trade financing um, as kind of the three big things that, that Comdex solves in the commodity trading world. And, and to kind of like jump in with some of my crazy ideas, like I, I, I wasn't aware that people were trading commodities that are being shipped, like in the process of being shipped. And I'm just yeah. like trying to think of this like whole ever given situation where like the ship is stuck on a canal. And if there was like instant efficiency of trading like commodities, like because like you know, I don't know, like rice from Malaysia is rice from Malaysia, whether it's on this ship or that ship, and like people could essentially build a futures market on when this ship will be dislodged, right? Because like the pricing will be different. And like, I mean, just like building more liquidity into where. There's like complete inefficiency and like time delays and things like that. I mean, that, that part, like, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I, again, I think that's where, you know, incentive alignment through crypto becomes really interesting, right? Where like, you know, most people thought DEXs will have no volumes, right? Like, like back in, you know, 2017, 18, DEXs did not have volumes, but like, look at DEXs today, right? It's just, um, you know, it's just how, you know, things have evolved in crypto and, um, I, I think that's where, you know, the use of a token to align incentives of multiple stakeholders in the ecosystem, right? Whether that's validators, whether that's, you know, stakers or the community members, whether that's the users um, of the product, um, you know, the team, the investors. I mean, you have so many different stakeholders that you need to align interests for. And, and that token becomes, you know, such a... Um, yeah, it's a double-edged sword because it's tough to manage as well. But I think if you manage it well, then the upside is is you know really good in terms of driving traction to certain products. Yeah. 
Well, I think, um, you know, tokenized real world assets, like, I think it has importance in two ways in that I think it has, it will like bring more accessibility of the commodities and trade market to more people. And secondly, it, and bringing the real world asset like to, you know, it will like also um, expand the DeFi market as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's inevitable, right? So like, you know, DeFi, mar- I think the market is about whatever the TVL is, I think 40, 50 billion. I haven't checked. Um, and um I truly think with, you know, like liquid staking, you know, pre-stake application itself or, you know, other liquid staking applications. Um, I think you have about 120 billion worth of assets that have been staked to secure different chains uh, at the moment uh, with the total POS market cap being 450 billion. So if you talk about like sort of DeFi as a whole, you can sort of within a year or so add another $100 billion dollars um, in terms of, you know, TVL as like a metric, uh, although that may not be the best metric, but again, it is a metric that, you know, everyone in the industry uses. Um, and so one is, you know, just sourcing newer assets within crypto to bring, you know, to facilitate borrowing lending and and things like that. Um, and then of course, um, trying to source assets from outside of crypto and bring it into crypto. Um, and bring fundamentally new capital into crypto because with something like liquid staking, you're building like getting existing capital that is already within crypto into into DeFi. Um, and so, again, from our perspective, what we want to do is create these different kinds of financial products. Some which are more geared towards you know crypto native folks solving immediate problems of unlocking liquidity and providing additional yields from you know staked assets um, to something that is you know, very different where you're helping commodity traders and bringing them into the crypto world or bringing, you know, at least originating those assets on chain. Yeah, yeah that's something that we're really, uh, that's one of our major focus areas, liquid staking. Because, yeah. you know, like so far, um, you know, uh, DeFi and uh, proof of stake, these were two different areas. Some, uh, in some ways, it's also a conflict, of, uh, there's a conflict of interest because yep. the state, the assets are there and you can't really do anything about it. But yep. um, uh, I learned that uh, uh, recently you guys um, uh, are collaborating with Injective Protocol and um, yep. working on liquid staking. So basically you can stake, earn staking rewards, um, help secure the network. And at the same time, you can uh, take advantage of all these DeFi opportunities. And yep. so for, uh, for some people, uh, I guess persistence is a very innovative way to uh, move commodities trading. Uh, for others, it could also be sort of like a new way of financing. Um, uh, like internally uh, at DSRV, we, we call this as a, uh, we call this as a pension, uh, staking pension. <laughs> And we think that this is really going to develop further in the future. So mm. this is an area that we, we would really love to collaborate with. Mm. Uh, absolutely. So I think, you know, first of all, I think if we take a step back and you, you know, go to community members and speak about staking, most people, first of all, think in t- staking in terms of DeFi staking, which is so different from POS staking. Um, I, I don't think people have a clear distinction between what staking for DeFi means and staking at the POS level means where you know, DeFi, which is mostly within Ethereum, has nothing to do with the chain, right? It's just incentive alignment. Um, whereas, of course, on the POS side, um, you know, it affects, you know, chain security and um, and it affects, you know, multiple other things. So I think first is just educating people about this difference between, because most people, you know, are very... Um, we are all, I think, uh, you know, we're all very biased here because we understand POS and, you know, we, you know, we may be involved with, uh, you know, multiple POS protocols or the Cosmos ecosystem. And so we understand it very well. And so we think that everyone else does, but most people do not understand POS staking and the implications that it has. Um, but I think that's going to change uh, massively once, you know, Ethereum, and it's a matter of when and not if, I think, 
uh, once you know Ethereum uh, transitions to uh, you know ETH 2.0 and, and POS. That's where there will be sort of widespread um, awareness about POS. So I think we're still super early in in terms of the evolution of POS. Like I think we've literally had it for like two years in production properly, um, which is you know super super early. Uh, so I think that is one. Um, you know, second is uh, yeah. So essentially, what we're doing is you know issuing um, representative coins of your underlying staked coins, which are earning staking rewards, you know, issuing representative coins, uh, with again on different chains as well. Uh, but actually starting with Ethereum, because that's where the most amount of liquidity is in terms of, um, and so we have essentially this, uh, custom bridge implementation between the cosmos hub and Ethereum, um, at, at this stage, but again, you know, as you know, IBC and, uh, IBC goes live, um, you know, it, in, in production, then we'll kind of, you know, migrate and, and see what works best in the context of this particular application. Um, and um, yeah, essentially, you know, once you have this representative coin, this representative coin can be traded, you know, like you said, you know, um, you know, in terms of a partnership with Injective, but we're also speaking to multiple borrowing lending platforms where you can borrow against um, your, rep, you know, your staked coin by using this representative coin as collateral. Um, and, um, you know, and so essentially, you know, it just creates, uh, you know, some very, very interesting use cases for unlocking liquidity from that staked asset while continuing to earn staking rewards um, in, in the background. Um, and so there's a few players out there, you know, trying to do it. Lido Finance, um, you know, is one, Staffy is another. Um, Anchor kind of fits into, Anchor is more, I think, complementary uh, in to you know some of these other platforms. But I think Lido, Staffy, and ourselves, I think, are the sort of you know three um, players. We haven't talked about it too much externally. We've been kind of building in stealth, but you know the application is ready. Just getting security audits done. Um, and I think we're one of the only um, that are focused. Our go-to market is through the Cosmos and you know, the Tenement ecosystem. So we're going to market with atoms um, and then rapidly expanding to other tenement based coins, including XPRT, but others as well. And, and I think people don't realize this, but the combined market cap of tenement based coins itself is, I think, like 60, 70 billion, if I'm not wrong, um, at, at this stage. So that's a you know, big enough market in and of itself. Um, and uh, also, one of the things I wanted to highlight is we have this unique two token model to implement liquid staking. Most people implement liquid staking through the C token or the A token model that Compound and Aave have implemented where you get this you know, C token uh, and that keeps accruing staking rewards in the background. But that's not actually how uh, you know, proof of stake works because if you stake your atom, you get unstaked atoms as rewards. Um, and so we're trying to replicate that very closely where um, we have a staked representation of a coin and an unstaked representation of a coin. As long as you're holding a staked representation of a coin, you keep accruing unstaked representation of a coin um, in your wallet. Um, so we have this two token model, which very closely mirrors how staking actually works at the POS protocol level. Um, and then that has implications in terms of not messing with the governance of the underlying protocol, which is why we implemented it two token model as well. Um, of course, that is a big problem to solve as well in terms of how do you ensure that you don't mess up the governance of the underlying protocol. Obviously, high level, you're improving the network security of the underlying protocol because more and more people are going to stake assets and chain secure because again, people are incentivized to um, stake more and hence network security improves automatically. Um, because you're incentivizing people to improve network security. But in terms of not messing up governance, that's a big, big problem uh, to solve and, and not an easy one to solve. Um, yeah, but I think, you know, like I, I see liquid staking similar to what flash loans are for DeFi, right? Like some people are concerned that like flash loan breaks DeFi, but I mean, I, I kind of like to hear the other side of the argument where they say like flash loans are basically like building up an immune system for 
for DeFi, where you know, as the market gets bigger, if there's enough money to pull this attack off, like they would have. So, I mean, ultimately, I think you know, obviously, there are potential issues to solve, but uh, I think just like having something out and ready uh, will build uh, an immune system for proof of stake, as Flash Loans did for DeFi as well. So, pretty excited to see that, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it's super, super early days, right? I mean, it's like, like how, you know, like ETH Lend, which is now Aave or Compound were back in like 2018, uh, where it was like, you know, like, you know, peer-to-peer -peer lending and very centralized because I remember using ETH Lend back in the day. Um, but you look at Aave today, right? How it's evolved. Um, I think liquid staking is kind of, you know, obviously, a lot of the primitives are now in place and so a lot of experiments have been run and so people are learning from all those experiments but i think yeah liquid saying is still you know super super early and there's definitely going to be some you know some kinks uh but yeah it, it, i think from a use case perspective it's a no-brainer uh, uh you know to work on this and it would be amazing to work with with you know with, with you guys with the srv on on that i think like we're super excited about uh about this application as well um and uh, yeah nice nice so i'm very looking forward to um i'm very looking forward for the collaboration between the srb and persistence for the you know liquid staking yeah, you know, yeah. for my pension <laughs> <laughs> and also i think i mean i don't know what you you know mentioned pension in the context of but yeah like i think you know validators over a longer period first of all i think there will be uh, you know, banks and consulting firms that will be running validator nodes um, uh, because, you know, it will just be a requirement. So you will have, you know, entities like PwC and Accenture and, you know, maybe the McKinsey's and, you know, the standard charters of the world, you know, running validator nodes. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, again, I think, you know, uh, you know, from, from that perspective, it's essentially like, you know, uh, they're getting rewards in like perpetuity almost, you know, as long as the network mm -hmm. has. Yes. Well, the network goes yes. on. Like, <laughs> yes, please. Not like buying government bonds, right? Like it's the minimum interest rate, except <laughs> rather than betting on the government not going down, you're just kind of expecting that this blockchain will take off, which could be yeah, you know, in like five, 10 years, right? Yeah. And, you know, the craziest thing is I was talking to my parents about this and I was like, you know, so we launched the persistence token in last week and um, it was crazy. Like, you know, you know, everyone, a lot of the, you know, service providers and, uh, you know, folks wanted to get, you know, paid in like US dollars or ETH before we launched. But now after the launch, everyone wants to get paid in XPRT. Like, it's crazy. Like people would rather take like the persistence token in payment over, you know, US dollars and, um which is obviously it. i mean it makes sense but like if you take a step back and think about it then you're like you know um you know it's it's uh, it's, it's crazy but yeah i think you know having again i think there's some interesting models to fund startups as well uh, which is how like because of our experience of not being able to raise capital um and then using you know uh nodes as a way to fund development for about like a six month period where we were really struggling. Um, uh, I think can be a model for other startups as well. Of course, right now in a bull market, you know, almost anyone and everyone, you know, can, can raise, but I think the true, true, you know, truly good projects are built in bear markets. And uh, a lot of the big projects that we see right now as well, actually raise capital in the previous bull and kind of build through the bear, um, you know, in 2018, 19, and then benefited, you know, in the 2020, 21 kind of cycle. Um, and so again, we don't know if that cycle is going to repeat or not, but there's definitely going to be pullbacks. And, you know, obviously the industry still has a lot of like tourists, for example, and a lot of opportunists and a lot of scammers. Um, but I think it's, you know, going to get, you know, yeah, I mean, it's not easy to build a product and manage it well, let alone an ecosystem. Um, and uh, yeah, but I think, you know, people with good intentions, you know, can, you know, uh, build things. And then the great thing about crypto is that as long as the industry survives, you sort of have funding in perpetuity. 
at, at some level or at least some ways of having capital in perpetuity to keep building yeah. but it's only about intention like i read this thing where you know it's um like it's apathy that kills a blockchain nothing else right like you if you care about it it works um and if you put enough effort you know something works at some point it might take you a little bit longer to get your product market fit but anyone who's put in a lot of effort has had some results some level of product market fit i think well um well it's been already 50 minutes and i think it's time for us to end this ama but um let's end this ama with the last question um we just got a question from our community member and he or she said why did you name the project name as persistence yep and so it's you know we call it commit uh, earlier uh, for commitment um and also like committing code um but um, there was another project in singapore called commit and we didn't want any kind of issues so um just before coming out of stealth um almost 15 months ago um you know kind of debated quite a bit in terms of you know what would be a good name and you know persistence was something that there was unanimous agreement in terms of something that again we've i think come we've you know like a lot of our employees are like you know like true misfits i, I would say like you know truly like you know like um whatever like uh, have you know i've uh, uh, like big big misfits but we've kind of created this culture within the company where we're very accepting and um create safe spaces for everyone to kind of flourish and i think one thing that is uh, you know truly um i think the same about everyone is that everyone is pulling so much weight and i think it's you know it's just pure persistence that has gotten us to this point like Uh, you know it's it's like in korea you have like you know uh, you have hashed and you have like korean specific funds and you know korea specific exchanges right um china has its own ecosystem the us has its own ecosystem um you know but for us like we're sort of like you have to do more than everyone else to um to tap into the korean ecosystem or to tap into the american ecosystem to tap into the chinese ecosystem Uh, so it's it's a bad like even like in whether it's funds whether it's exchanges you know other service providers um everything is more difficult if you are not based in one of these kind of hot spots um uh, or if you don't speak the language uh, so uh, yeah i think from our perspective you know it's been it's been a you know it's been a battle to get to this point but also i think it it has made us more resilient uh, and and hungrier as well Uh, compared to you know a lot of the you know like chinese based projects so silicon valley based projects who might have more capital but don't have the same amount of energy or hunger or or ambitions uh so i think you know that's why i think persistence was a name and and the thing is uh, we didn't want to call it persistence protocol or persistence network that's why the name is just persistence um you know because our ambitions you know i view persistence as this sort of suite of you know um sort of products and so we wanted to be yeah not restricted to being called a protocol persistence protocol is just part of the bigger persistence umbrella um and uh, yeah so that's uh, yeah it's just a name that everyone resonated with and i think the community has you know mm-hmm. responded well oh well you guys have come very far like to the i mean to this point and we see you, you know you guys are going to go you know even like grow even faster and hopefully, hopefully yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so yeah. Is there is one last thing you would like to say to the korean community um yeah i mean i, I think uh, nothing in particular you know just you know uh, you know if i guess follow our social media to keep you know stay updated with all of the developments i think the pstake application should be very exciting i think that is uh, one that everyone should definitely look out for and we'll be releasing more details um in the coming days and weeks uh, about that application and it will be great to get you know uh, i know uh, korea has a lot of like atom holders and holders of other pos coins um so it would be great to um you know get uh you know support and feedback on on that application yeah apart from that uh, you know 
we're always available to answer questions, you know, in our Telegram community, in our Discord. So if you have any questions, any concerns, you know, please send it to us. We're getting a lot of messages, so there may be a you know small amount of delay in getting back, but um, we'll, we'll try to get back to you know everyone as much as possible. Right. So do you guys have some viewers want to add more? Or? Yes. Um. Uh, uh, I want to. I want to thank Tushar, uh, Tushar for his interest and uh, engagement with the Korean community. I know he's. He's been in Korea uh, several years before, and he's been actively engaging with us. So I really, I really appreciate that. Yeah, and for me, I think um, it's a novel space, and anything novel in crypto is exciting for me. So uh, yeah, it's just it's like, it's, like, it's like having a new Lego block that just like didn't exist, and it means there's more stuff that could be created on top of it. So um, yeah, exciting to see what this Lego block. I also want to, yeah, uh, sorry, to, um, but yeah, I also want to thank you guys. Thanks to Nons and to DSRB for the support and to, you know, Chinapsis, Kepler for the support. Yeah. Right. Okay. So this now, uh, this is the end of the AMA. And um, uh, I would like to thank to the people who's been watching. Uh, 여러분 오늘 AMA 시청해 주셔서 정말 감사드리고요. 어, 오늘 중간 중간 질문 주신 분들께는 저희가 추첨해서 따로 에어드랍이나 다른 이제 리워드를 드리도록 하겠습니다. 어, 감사드리고 다음에 또 인사드릴게요. Thank you everyone. 감사합니다. Bye. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much guys. Bye.